our other committee meetings are being recorded. Before we address the other items on the agenda, I will now take a roll call. We will start with uh, members of, of this committee. Jessica. Ann. Here. Stephanie. Here. Other board members that are on the call, would you please identify yourself? Scott Wetwin. Hey, John, Jerry DeLong. Lauren Nikorski. Hi, this is Jessica Walzavell. I'm having trouble with teams, so I'm sorry. I'm joined by phone. Okay, well, good morning. Good morning. Okay, any other members? Uh, seeing no additional members. Our first item on our uh, agenda is the approval of the January 20th uh, uh, committee meeting minutes. Uh, are, uh, are there any uh, corrections to those minutes? Seeing no corrections, do I have a motion to approve? The second. Second. Um, all in favor of the uh, minutes as submitted, say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? Any opposed? Seeing none, the uh, minutes are approved. Thank you very much. The first item on the agenda is the South Hills Junction conceptual plan presented by Moria Igler. Yes. Is the um, one we're on? Oh, there's me. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Hello, everybody. Good morning. My name is Maura Egler. I am the Transit Oriented Communities Project Manager in our Planning and Service Development Department. Um, and I will be giving an overview of our South Hills Junction Station Area Plan, which just wrapped up uh, in February. So just to start with a, our project timeline, um, back in 2011, a study was conducted by the city of Pittsburgh called Smart TRID, which explored a transit revitalization investment district or TRID, uh, which was would have been centered around South Hills Junction. This would have created a special taxing district to fund transportation improvements at and around the junction. So at the time, it was found that the trade was not feasible, but the study did spark the imagination of the community and showed what might be possible on site. Our own study was influenced by some of the ideas in Smart Trade. So fast forward to 2016, um, our TOD guidelines were created, which basically represents the beginning of our kind of TOC, Transit Oriented Communities Program, and identified station typologies for our fixed guideway stations. This paved the way for our station area planning process. And South Hills Junction is the fourth of these station area plans that we've completed. So our own planning process started back in May of 2021, which was the first kind of public meeting that we had on this project with two more community touch points in August and November of 2021. And then the final plan being published this year in February of 2022. Next slide, please. So for public engagement, um, our first meeting in May of 2021 focused on existing conditions and hearing thoughts from the community on what they would like to see on site. At meeting two, two different scenarios for the site were developed and uh, we asked the public to provide feedback on both of those scenarios. At this, at this round of meetings, we were able to do an in-person pop-up event right down the street at the Warrington Rec Center, which was a very successful uh, event getting community feedback. We also did another pop up at the station itself to sort of engage with riders in real time at the station. And finally, meeting three in November was based um, based on public feedback. The final scenario was chosen for the site and presented to the community. All of these meetings, except for the pop ups, were virtual, and we used Social Pinpoint, an online engagement website, to solicit feedback and provide project information. We got lots of helpful comments um, this way as well. This slide shows some examples of those comments, and it gave people another um, remote option to engage with us during the pandemic. Um, we have a link to our project website, which is still active, um, where all of the project documents are housed. It will remain live, and all the final plans will also be housed there. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the overall um, conceptual master plan and the improved site 
So there's a lot going on here. I will try to summarize everything. Um, this includes improving all six access points into the station, including rebuilding the steps at Parr Street and at Jasper Street. It includes an accessible walking trail from Albert Street in Mount Washington, um, and that provides access to the Harwood steps using an old railroad right of way. This will become a 5% grade accessible uh, walkway for people to access that part of the station. We'll do a realigned intersection at Haberman and Warrington Avenues, which will enhance pedestrian safety and make this a more obvious and welcoming entrance to the station. There'll be streetscape improvements along Warrington Avenue, including wider sidewalks and street trees, improved pedestrian crosswalks at Montooth and Bogston streets, including a rebuilt ADA ramp at Bogston with an accessible sidewalk. Um, and the most exciting element to us and to the community was a new pedestrian bridge that will span the top of the junction and will connect the top of the Lalea Street steps, which are on the Mount Washington side, to Warrington Avenue on the Beltsuver side. There will also be a new control tower and elevator that will allow travel from the pedestrian bridge down into the station area. Um, and of course, there will be a rebuilt and redesigned station that combines bus and rail on one platform. Next slide. So this is the detail of the actual station itself. It shows the combined bus and rail platform at the new station. There will be a third kind of reversible center lane that will allow vehicles to bypass other, should there be a breakdown or some other kind of emergency. But you, you will be catching either bus or rail in the same on the same platform here. There will also be new seating, windscreens, new lighting, um, and other amenities such as trash receptacles, as well as a canopy that will span the entire platform. Um, and then the new design would allow for off-board payment of, for all modes at South Hills Junction, bus and rail. So that would be a new, new thing for the Port Authority. Next slide, please. So we also looked at opportunities for transit-oriented development on site. We looked at three locations. First was parcel A, which is the current site of the salt shed. Um, parcel B, which is called the rail, rail tie storage area where we store old rail ties. And then parcel C is what we call the M loop, or it's basically employee parking and a bus kind of turnaround. Um, so this, is, this scenario here is just a test fit to demonstrate one type of development that could fit on site here. Our team conducted a market analysis that showed that we could support up to 100,000 square feet of commercial space on site with 800 feet of retail frontage along Warrington Avenue. Um, a new intersection could be constructed at Delmont and Warrington to accommodate vehicles accessing these buildings um, they, with parking underneath potentially each structure. Um, parcel A shows townhomes and perhaps an opportunity for an affordable home ownership model. Um, we expect that any development on parcels B and C would be mixed use with residential and commercial with a strong preference for affordable housing component in the residential units. Next slide, please. So the cost estimate, the total construction costs are range between 53 and 69 million. I should note that this is, these are just the cost for construction. They do not, this does not include uh, account for inflation or soft costs such as staff time, site prep for the TOD, or the relocation of our facilities. Um, but we could, you know, phase the project in such a way that would help reduce upfront costs while also keeping the potential for development um, intact. So we could limit the amount of upfront investment through a phasing process. Um, for example, funding the station aspect first while assembling our development partnership is an option here to, for phasing. Next slide, please. So our implementation strategy, we've got kind of short-term, mid-term, and long-term. The first thing that absolutely has to happen is our facilities master plan. This was called out as a priority in our long range plan next transit. This would help determine where facilities like the salt shed and the rail tie storage area might be better suited within our system. Um, we of course would have to identify funding sources for both design and construction. We will develop a Port Authority E TOD policy or an equitable TOD policy that would outline specific steps we could take as an agency to encourage equitable development on our property. Um, so those are the short-term 
um, implementation strategies. And then midterm would be actually designing the physical station, um, of course, pursuing construction funding, and then starting the RFP process with a developer for us to enter into a joint agreement um, to do a development on our property. And then longer term, we would of course formalize that joint development partnership and then sta the station, access to the station and transit oriented development would be constructed in about five to eight years. Um, so all of the documents associated with this final plan can be found both on our project website as well as Port Authority's website, portauthority.org slash South Hills Junction. So with that, I will take any questions. Um, thank you very much, Maura, for that uh, great presentation. Um, are there any uh, questions of committee members? Uh, no questions, but it looks it looks really well done. I, I like the concept, so thank you for sharing. Thank uh, you. Uh, thank you. Uh, any uh, board members have have questions uh, of Maura? Okay. Quick are there any? Go, go ahead. Quick comment, Mr. Tech. I, I like this. This is really great, Maura. So thank you for the slides, and I really enjoyed the presentation. Looking forward to this. <clears throat> Thank, Thank you. you. Are, there, are there any uh, stakeholders on the call that have a question of Maura? Okay. Uh, thank you again. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, David Huffaker, a summary of public input for service changes, comments, period, slash public hearing. David. Good morning, uh, Committee Chair Tag and the rest of the Planning and Stakeholder Relations Committee and the board and other stakeholders. Uh, thank you for the opportunity today. Um, I'm here, actually, I've got two items to talk about. The first one, as, as uh, uh, Mr. Tag pointed out, is a, a report out from our uh, public hearing process that we did through the, um, uh, in response to uh, need to do public outreach for our November 2020 pandemic service changes. Uh, and so I am going to, if I can get the slide to advance, there we go. Um, uh, just give a, a brief report out on that process. As you'll recall, the uh, uh, board authorized a public outreach process uh, public comment period beginning in December on December 1st and that period lasted for two months through February 1st. Um, we also did a uh, public uh, question and answer session and an information session where we gave people a chance just to learn more about what this uh, hearing was about and uh, how to uh, provide public comment. And then we actually did do a, a public a formal public hearing on January 27th. Uh, at that hearing, we did get six public comments uh, and the range of, of concerns and questions. Of course, uh, everyone was would like to see service restored back to normal levels as quickly as possible. Uh, and as we uh, talked about the, the process for restoring service, there were uh, desires to see transparency in our process and an understanding of what that, that decision process will look like. Um, and would like to have some public input into how the service is restored. Um, and then also there, there were, uh, out of the 15 routes that did have uh, major service reductions, there were specific concerns about uh, three routes uh, that uh, the, the public had felt would uh, be worthy of first consideration when we do restore that service. And so we certainly will be taking that input into our um, uh, thought process as we work on future uh, service changes and, and try to get back to normal. Uh, and we certainly would desire to uh, provide those connections, particularly for essential workers uh, and ensure that they are not left out of, of other changes. Uh, and of course, uh, there were comments and, and concerns about uh, making sure that we place more emphasis on uh, people who are reliant on transit uh, and that is certainly something that that fits within our current uh, protocols as well. Uh, so uh, we're encouraged by the amount of participation that took place during this uh, hearing and public comment process. We will have a uh, book of all of the written comments is currently being prepared and will be shared with the board. Uh, and so uh, all board members will have a chance to review all of the commentary, both written uh, and uh, oral. 
Uh, we had uh, uh, hearing uh, notes that will be uh, transcribed and, and uh, put down on paper for the board. And that report will also be made available for the public through our website. Uh, and so we will uh, make appropriate notifications and, and that should all be available by the time of the next board meeting. Uh, there were no uh, resolutions or, or any board action required from this process, but we did think it was a great opportunity to connect with our customers and our stakeholders and see if there were uh, uh, specific considerations that we need to be thinking about as we're, as we're attempting to restore our service back to uh, pre-pandemic levels. Uh, so with that, I will hold and see if there are any uh, questions or comments. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, David. Any uh, questions or comments from uh, committee members? No questions, John. Okay, uh, thank you. Any uh, board members with questions? Seeing none, any uh, stakeholders on the call have questions for uh, David? Seeing none, uh, I guess the last item on the agenda is the bridge program overview and the recent service uh, related changes. David? Yes. Uh, so, uh, as you uh, would expect, there has been a lot of attention placed on bridges since the last time we had a committee meeting. And I thought it might be an appropriate time for me to provide a, a brief overview of our bridge program, uh, including just sort of an inventory of what are the, the bridges that we maintain and, and uh, in some cases retain ownership of. Uh, what do we do with that maintenance responsibility and, and what does our program look like? And then uh, wanted to specifically update uh, the what's happening at the Sawmill Run Boulevard Bridge, uh, as well as some of our service changes related to that uh, closure, and the, as well as the longer term closure that we expect to experience on the Fern Hollow Bridge. Uh, so with that, let me get here. Okay, so uh, Port Authority, uh, has uh, maintenance responsibility for 79 bridges. Uh, and to uh, give you a sense of how that is spread out among our system, it's about 40% of our um, bridges are, are actually light rail or light rail only bridges. That's about 31 of them. Uh, we have about 34 bridges that are uh, related to our bus system, particularly the busways. Uh, so the east busway, west and south busways, we have about 34 bridges. And then we have three bridges related to our incline or, or to, to either the Mon incline or the Duquesne incline. And then an additional 11 bridges that are what we call local bridges. Uh, those are bridges that essentially were consolidated into the Port Authority when uh, Port Authority was formed from the uh, combination of the private railways and, and uh, uh, the various systems that uh, fed uh, the infrastructure to Port Authority. We, uh, in some cases, actually uh, operate service on some of those local bridges, but in some cases they are also just uh, bridges that, that uh, operate for vehicle traffic. Um, we do have a number of bridges that are actually more than 100 years old, uh, so this requires a significant amount of spending and, and care and feeding, if you will. Uh, and so we have averaged over the past few years spending about $7 million, uh, either inspecting, repairing, re rehabilitating. In some cases, we've actually replaced uh, bridges in our system. Uh, so uh, I feel very strong that we're in a good position with our bridge program and, and hope you'll feel that way after we're done here. Um, so the, uh, we've learned a lot about condition scores uh, in, our, in uh, the bridge inventory over the past month or so. And again, out of our 79 bridges, our average condition score is a 6.1, which would be a, in the satisfactory uh, classification which is a good thing, we'd like it to be higher. And, and so our program is always intended to uh, put that at, at a higher level. Um, but we have um, a number of bridges that actually are in, in what we call poor condition. That would be uh, a rating of four. We have nine of those bridges. And interestingly, five of those are, are some of the local bridges. Uh, so we, in, in those cases, we oftentimes are coordinating with other jurisdictions. Some of those local bridges have quite complicated uh, ownership uh, responsibilities uh, shared with cities, 
or boroughs, as well as railways. And so we coordinate with uh, all parties on uh, keeping the, those bridges in a state of good repair. Um, I can tell you that all bridges with a score of four are either already programmed into our capital program, and, and we'll talk about the contracting approach here in just a minute, or are programmed in our 2023 capital plan. Um, and um, most of that work had been done prior to the uh, failures we're seeing, but of course there is a increased emphasis on uh, keeping those bridges in a state of good repair. So um, a lot of uh, discussion about inspections and most bridges are inspected on a two year cycle, a biennial uh, inspection process. Uh, if a bridge reaches a point of deterioration that it needs to be looked at more frequently, that could be annually, it could be quarterly or even more frequent than that. Uh, we do not have any bridges that need to be uh, inspected more than biennially. Uh, so uh, we continue to uh, coordinate with PennDOT on those, uh, those condition assessments. When we do an inspection, it's done by external consultants who are um, trained and certified by uh, PennDOT. Uh, they do an independent review. They have a strict checklist that they follow. Uh, and there are uh, generally accepted um, inspection principles that are followed. So um, that is uh, part of that uh, um, standard of, of care that's done by the external consultants. We uh, constantly have a, uh, a contract in place for those inspections and actually are in the middle of procurement for the next round of that uh, process. Uh, and in, in those cases, we have multiple contractors who are on the package, so there will be a, a, a primary uh, inspector and then a secondary inspector. Uh, so that does give us flexibility for uh, to be as nimble as possible if need be. Um, when we get an inspection report, those are reviewed uh, both by the in-house in uh, bridge team. We have a bridge and structures team, uh, and they also work with our consultant team to identify if there are any maintenance uh, requirements or uh, capital programming that needs to be put in place. Uh, we also take our results and we immediately put that in, and actually it's done by the external consultants, put that information into the state, um, the, the PennDOT uh, bridge management system uh, that tracks all bridges throughout the state. And so that information is tracked by PennDOT. Uh, we work directly with PennDOT District 11, who then coordinates with the bridge program uh, at Harrisburg. Uh, and so that group will stay on top of the inspection cycles and will um, provide an, an additional uh, maintenance check for us to make sure that the inspections are happening on time. And if they did not happen on time, then we would uh, get a notice about that. So we stay ahead of that cycle and make sure that we're doing our inspections uh, as, as, um, uh, as required by the schedule. Um, also, this is a, a case where uh, we have a see something, say something program. And so if anyone, uh, Port Authority or public who identifies an issue with the bridge can notify us or uh, particularly uh, will let the staff know that they've seen something that looks out of place. That actually is how the Sawmill Run Boulevard Bridge uh, anomaly was, was noted. There was a maintenance crew that was out in the, the busways reviewing the snow removal uh, that had gone on the day of that, uh, um, I think that was February 3rd. And they noted that there was a larger than expected gap in the uh, uh, expansion joint for the Sawmill Run Bridge. They, um, well, we'll talk about that in just a minute, but uh, it was thanks to their uh, keen eyes and uh, and training to be looking out for anomalies that we were able to identify this quickly before anything uh, serious had happened. So um, we also do uh, contract for uh, rehabilitation work. Uh, again, as I described, uh, when we get an inspection report, we will uh, compare those results to uh, previous inspection reports, identify if there are any anomalies. We will take a look at where um, the particular bridge falls within our 12-year capital program and identify if we need to change the timing of that or perhaps the bridge is in good shape and we can defer some of that work. Uh, but we will um, take a look at um, a, a particular scope that's required to maintain a state of good repair for that bridge. We have uh, 
uh, ability to decide if we're going to do a full uh, replacement of a bridge. You can see the, the North Braddock Avenue bridge is pictured here. That was a replacement that we did back in 2019. Um, we can also do repairs or just regular maintenance to, to keep the bridge in, in a state of good repair. Uh, the board approved a bridge restoration group project in January of this year, uh, which is one of our continuing uh, one of our continuing continuing. Sorry, we're getting a little feedback here. Um, where it uh, that bridge restoration group project is one of our packages that we have on hand so that we can uh, continue to advance our capital program. Uh, we also would look at doing a specific uh, request for proposals if there was a relatively large scope of work. And so a bridge such as the Panhandle Bridge, which is a very large project, is something that in the future we will be taking out as a separate contacted, contracted project. Um, I'll also note that in an event like we have seen at Sawmill Run, we use our ancillary contracts that also uh, have been recently approved by the board. And the ancillary contractors are a um, they have uh, both bridge expertise and, and emergency uh, capabilities to respond to uh, events in the field. So uh, I think we're well positioned contractually to address the, the bridge program. Um, so the Sawmill Run Bridge. Uh, so on February 3rd, as I described, the, we noted the anomaly. Uh, that bridge is a just over a thousand foot long span. It's actually a series of spans, but it's considered one bridge. Uh, running over Route 51, and it was built in 1977. Uh, it actually replaced a previous structure that was adjacent to this structure. Um, and uh, as I described, the anomaly was noted by our maintenance staff as they were reviewing the, the busway. Uh, they immediately called in our engineering team. They were on site uh, within the hour. Uh, they brought in our, our bridge uh, inspector uh, team as well as our uh, construction uh, support to review uh, the status of the bridge. And it was determined that uh, to be um, proactive and uh, in a state of, of utmost caution, let's close the bridge and do some forensic engineering work to determine what the cause of this gap was. There's a, a little diagram here. It's a, gonna be very hard to see, um, but uh, if I can kind of put it into layman's terms, essentially, um, what happened that day, and if you'll recall, that day was kind of an unusual weather day overnight. There had been rain turning to freezing rain, and then it almost immediately turned to uh, much colder conditions. And so what had happened was some water had infiltrated into the support structure, and it's a little hard to see, but there's a, a blue piece there that shows where the water was coming in in the support structure, and then it, it essentially flash froze. And so when things freeze, they expand. And typically uh, when they expand, they're looking for places to expand to. It can't go up because there's a rail on top of the bridge. So that kind of keeps a, a cap on it. And what we discovered was there was actually an old abutment uh, behind the bridge that was affixed to the, to the hillside. And so that was also immovable. So the only place for that expansion to happen was to push on the support structure of the bridge. So the the orange steel um, uh, support structure was pushed uh, slightly, a matter of inches, uh, pushed into the rest of the span. And uh, so that caused the, the further expansion of the joint. So we, we identified the issue. So uh, we have done taken the past uh, two weeks to do some forensic engineering. We cleared out some of the debris. We were able to uh, jack up the bridge. Uh, slightly. This is, a, again, a matter of inches and fractions of inches, but we're able to jack up the bridge to have access to the understructure. And we do believe we've identified the, the general repairs that need to be done. And uh, we just made an announcement that the bridge is expected to be out of service for uh, 10 to 12 weeks. So just under three months, we hope, from, from this point. That uh, is somewhat dependent on making sure that we don't have any supply chain issues, but we feel uh, confident that we can execute the repairs in a relatively expeditious process. But uh, certainly any disruption, this is a key connection point for our bus serv service and our light rail service into downtown, uh, certainly uh, is something that we're trying to minimize. So um, we will hopefully uh, uh, make progress there and uh, we'll, we'll certainly keep the public informed as, as things are advancing. 
So uh, service implications, as I said, the Sawmill Run Bridge is our key connection point for the Red Line as well as the, the South Busway uh, into downtown. Uh, so what we've had to do is push all of our customers onto the Blue Line and the Silver Line over Overbrook. Um, and that has uh, uh, essentially uh, required us to put a bus shuttle into the Beachview neighborhood, uh, from, connecting from Fallow Field uh, into uh, um, uh, uh, Potomac. And so we get then the customers are able to access the Blue Line and the and the Silver Line through Willow uh, at our Castle Shannon Junction there. Um, so. Uh, we are continuing to refine how that, that uh, bus shuttle works, and uh, we feel like we've got a good uh, system in place to help uh, uh, get those customers connected to the system as, as they need. Um, so again, we expect it to be out uh, two to three months from this period, uh, and we'll keep the public informed as we make progress there. Uh, briefly, uh, the Fern Hollow Bridge, which is not one of our bridges, uh, as, as you all know, that's under a, a NTSB investigation, so there really isn't much for us to say, but I did want to address the service implications for Fern Hollow. Uh, we have two major bus routes, 61A and 61B, uh, that use the Fern Hollow Bridge coming from points east, and, um, and we do expect that this is going to be a very long-term uh, detour, a matter of uh, perhaps years, if if not uh, um, certainly more than months. And uh, so those buses are currently detouring onto Penn Avenue, and then they turn uh, onto Dallas and get back to Forbes Avenue and, and continue on their normal path uh, into downtown. Uh, we're also going to be looking at some other options. There has been some uh, discussion about per perhaps uh, beefing up some of the service on the East Busway. Uh, to alleviate some of the pressure on the, the Forbes Avenue service. Um, we'll continue to be studying that. And, and unfortunately, this uh, interruption came just as we had uh, finalized uh, the most recent service change. So uh, we're looking at uh, maybe supplements to the detours and or uh, future changes that we'll be making to the system. Um, We've also been taking a look at the, the entire rest of our service and uh, determining if there are any other service issues related to bridges uh, for our system. And happily, we have not identified anything that was not already known. We do have a couple bridges that have weight restrictions on them, uh, but those have been known and, and we operate accordingly uh, and are in, in uh, coordination with uh, uh, PennDOT on the Smithfield Avenue Bridge as well as uh, with the city at the uh, 28th Street Bridge, which are the two bridges that do have weight restrictions. We've also reviewed all of our other service to identify if there might be potential issues, uh, as well as uh, not just the in-service routing, but the uh, routing to and from the garages. And we have not identified any other place where there might be concerns for service. Um, we are updating instructions for each of the garages to ensure that uh, operators have proper information about where they can and can't go as far as bridges go. Uh, but again, we've been working in, in close concert with our operations and operations training staff to ensure that they have the information they need to uh, properly instruct operators. Uh, so that is all I was going to talk about on bridges. I'm happy to answer any questions or attempt to answer questions. And uh, so uh, I'm here. Uh, any uh, questions of committee members of David? No questions, just thank you for the information. Very useful. Exactly. Any uh, uh, board members have any questions of, of David? Yes, John. Uh, David, it's Michelle Smianic. Question for you on the BTU neighborhood as we're running shuttles through there. Um, how's it going in the neighborhood? Because I had seen some evening news footage where we had some unhappy neighbors some tight curbs and tight turns for the buses with snow and, and cars on the road there. How, how's that going? Yes, it was a, a rocky first couple days as, as we were uh, reintegrating our bus service into Beachview. There, it's been quite some time since there's been regular bus service on, on Broadway. And uh, so we identified actually a couple pinch points and uh, some potential uh, parking issues and uh, and as well as uh, working with our operators on, on how best to navigate through that neighborhood. I have not seen uh, a large number of complaints since those first couple days. 
Um, but uh, we'll continue to monitor that and, and work with our operations team to ensure that we're being good neighbors as we uh, 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 hopefully have a relatively short uh, period of detour. Thank you. Uh, any other uh, questions of board members? Yeah, I just have a quick question um, as it relates to uh, some community engagement and keeping the communities abreast of what's going on around them. Are, are we planning any strategy to reach out um, via survey or, or pop up or anything hands on, David? That's a good question. I would say that we have not had that discussion that I'm aware of uh, as of right now, uh, but that's something that we could certainly take into account as we uh, attempt to uh, incorporate public feedback. We definitely review any comments that come in through our customer service, both phone and uh, emailed comments, and we, mm -hmm. those are handled in real time. Uh, I don't think we had plans for doing any sort of uh, survey of the neighborhood, uh, but uh, that's something we could certainly consider. Uh, thank you, uh, Stephanie. Uh, the, um, uh, any uh, stakeholders have any questions of David? Seeing none, uh, th thank you again, David, for both thank your you. presentations and uh, um, just keep uh, keep us all informed about what's what's going on. What you do, um, we, do we have, certainly will. Thank you. Uh, do uh, I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. So I have a motion to adjourn. The meeting stands in adjournment until our committee meetings uh, next month. Thank you very much for everybody joining the call today. Have a Thanks. good day. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll just take a second to switch gears to the Finance Committee. Let me pull up my agenda. Okay, uh, before we address the items on our agenda, I'll take a uh, roll call. We'll start with members of this committee. Uh, Board Member Liptak, are you present? Here. Uh, board member uh, representative Davis and board member Delon. Good morning. Morning. Um, if there are any other board members present, please please identify yourselves by name. Jeff Wetwin. Michelle Smianek. Stephanie Terman. Lori Mazgorski. John Tag. Okay, thank you. We'll now move on to the agenda. Let me switch over to that. Uh, the first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from the January 20th Finance Committee meeting. Do I have any questions or revisions to the meeting minutes? Okay, do I have a motion to approve? No, moved. Can I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. The minutes are approved. Okay, we have two resolutions this morning. The first is authorization to extend and amend the agreement for fair model development and related Title VI fair equity analysis services. Pete. Star 1, 15. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and uh, board members. Sorry for that. Uh, Technical problem. Um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so the first resolution uh, for your consideration is the uh, authorization to uh, extend uh, for fair model development services back in October. In accordance with the uh, board adopted procurement policy, we did issue an RFP for fair model development and also Title VI equity analysis. Um, some of the services that are included in that RFP are um, a, a review of the authority's fair structure, a review of our fair policies and any strategies for improvement. Um, they also provide a fair model, um, which is used to uh, model out uh, various fair, fair changes 
and uh, then they are responsible for providing a Title VI analysis, which is required anytime you would do any type of a uh, fair change. Um, in January of 2019, the board authorized a three-year agreement with Four Nines Technology uh, with two additional option years at the authority's sole discretion. Uh, that was for $210,000. Next slide, please. Partial. Um, and uh, to date, the uh, services performed by uh, Four Nines have been deemed satisfactory and in compliance with that agreement. Um, the uh, authority has determined it's our, in our best interest to exercise the first of those two option years. So I should mention that this is more or less just a uh, to keep a firm on retainer. It's on a work order basis only. This resolution uh, authorizes uh, an, an increase in the amount uh, by $200,000, taking it from $210,000 to $410,000. Uh, can I answer any questions? Any questions from the committee? Any questions from other board members? Okay. Do I have a motion to um, send this resolution to, for the board's consideration next week? So moved. I'll second. second. Okay, thanks. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Our second resolution, authorization to enter into an agreement to provide pension plan actuarial services. Pete. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, so the pension plan actuarial services uh, include things like they do uh, Review of uh, pension calcs for any uh, uh, folks that are going to be retiring. They provide actuarial reports uh, on an annual basis for uh, all three plans, the ATU plan, the uh, IBW plan, and the non-rep plan. They also provide 10-year uh, projections that we use as part of the uh, uh, budget process and also the um, financial um, financial plan. There are requirements, uh, government uh, requirements, SCASB 67, 68, and 75 uh, requirements that the actuarial actuaries perform. They also work with, uh, they also have a model uh, that uh, assists with making changes in actuarial assumptions which are used during any uh, labor negotiations if, if pension is an issue that uh, needs to be uh, looked at in, in further detail. And um, they also um, keep us abreast of any changes that um, are required by law when it comes to uh, pension changes. So this uh, once again was uh, we uh, had a committee uh, and put out an RFP in accordance with board adopted uh, policies. We had six responses, which uh, came in in December of 2021. Cowden Associates was determined to be the highest rated proposal. We had members of the Human Resources, the Finance Committee um, that made up the Selection Committee. This would be a four year agreement uh, for a total not to exceed amount of $1,082,350 with two additional option years at the sole discretion of the authority. Can I answer any questions on this resolution? Any questions of committee members? All right, any questions of uh, other board members? Okay. Do I have a motion to approve this resolution to go to the board? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, and let's see, our final agenda item is review of the January 2022 financial statements. Thank you. 
So uh, for the month of January, our total operating income was $3.9 million below budget, uh, once again, primarily due to lower passenger revenues. Passenger revenues were lower than our December totals by $934,000, which was to be expected. Uh, some of our uh, December revenue uh, is actually, or December ridership is actually billed in, in January. Um, so due to the holidays, uh, some of that um, uh, would be lower in January. Monthly pass sales were $332,135 lower for the month of January than December. And also the U-Pass sales were down $282,687 from December totals. Our total operating income for the fiscal year is uh, uh, $26.5 million below budget with uh, every revenue category below budget currently. From a expense perspective, just for the month of January, our total expenses, $1.9 million below budget due to lower wages and salaries, materials and supplies, and also utilities. Uh, the total expenses for the year, uh, however, are down or are below budget by $29.6 million uh, with every expense category currently below plan. Subsidies. Uh, for the month, we're $6.2 million below plan uh, due to a timing issue with state operating assistance and then also lower preventive maintenance invoicing. For the fiscal year, our subsidies are $4 million below budget, uh, and that's due to the timing issue with state operating assistance as well as lower vehicle overhaul invoicing. From a year over year perspective, our total operating income, however, is $10.6 million higher than last fiscal year, which is good news. Um, and that's due to higher passenger revenues and also some higher access shared ride uh, revenue reimbursement. Total expenses, $3.5 million higher than last fiscal year due to higher wages and salaries, other expense and access uh, expense. Subsidies, uh, total subsidy, $7 million lower than last fiscal year due to lower preventive maintenance and federal stimulus invoicing. Uh, however, uh, we will be submitting a another ARPA invoice um, today um, to eliminate the, the current deficit of around $10 million. Uh, year over year, Oh, that, that's the same. Uh, is there another slide after that? Uh, from an operating reserve perspective, we began January with 142 million in operating reserves. We had cash inflows of $56.1 million uh, from passenger revenues and other grant subsidies. Our cash outflows were $39.3 million for wages and salaries and uh, other services. So at the end of January, we had operating reserves of approximately $158.8 million. Any questions? Okay, any questions from the committee or board members? Okay, thank you, Pete. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all we have on our agenda today. So do I have a motion to adjourn? Move. Thank you. Uh, we're adjourned and we'll see you in March. Thank you very much. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Michelle Smianek. We're getting ready for the Performance Oversight Committee meeting. So gather your papers here. We'll take 30 seconds and uh, shift gears. All right, everyone, so welcome to the Performance Oversight Committee. Our first item of business this morning is going to be a roll call. So we will be doing committee members first. Committee member Representative Davis, are you here this morning? Committee member Representative Lori Mazgorski, are you here this morning? 
Good morning, I'm present. Good morning, thank you. Do we have any other board members that are joining us this morning? Please state your name. Jeff Litwin. Ann O'Gorick. John Tag. Okay, great, thank you all. And our meeting continues to be recorded for those that are participating. So good morning, Mr. Trona. how are you? Good morning, fine, thank you. How are you, Madam Chair? Doing great. One more second here before we start with you. We need to have an approval of our January 20th meeting minutes. And so um, have, are there any corrections or additions to our meeting minutes? Having none, could I have a motion to approve our meeting minutes, Lori? So moved. I'm going to second that so our meeting minutes are approved. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. Trona, you are ready to go. So you must have some exciting things for us. So we are ready this morning for your resolutions. I do, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, committee members, board members, I have three items for your review and presentation to the full board for approval. All of our bids were publicly advertised and our e-business documents were distributed. The first being diesel exhaust fluid. We had seven. We had seven uh, firms accept our bid invitation. Four bids were received for the purchase of diesel exhaust fluid over a one year period with one option period. So our recommendation is that the contract be awarded to the low responsive bidder, which was Chemstream Inc. Estimated amount of $832,100 over the two year period. This price represents a 28% increase over the previous contracted price for this item three years ago. The price increase is due to the uh, cost of urea, which is the core ingredient in diesel exhaust fluid. The urea is up 121% from September uh, of 2021. The second item is biodiesel fuel. We had five bids uh, received for the purchase of our diesel fuel over a one year period with one option period. The recommendation that the contract be awarded to the low responsive bidder, which was Gutman Energy, estimated amount $16,668,720. The contractor's proposed fixed rate contract adder for overhead freight and profit margin was 0 0.0673 per gallon, which is a 3.5% decrease from the previous contracted price per gallon. Now, again, on our fuel bids, the awarded price goes on the contract adder, which I stated was the overhead freight and profit. So that's where the decrease is. However, market on the overhaul world market, oil continues to increase. So when you plug in our contract adder to the market price of oil, that's where you get the $16 million price tag right now. Number three, leasing and servicing of coach tires. Two bids were received for the purchase of these leasing services for coach tires over a three year period. The lowest bidder Goodyear tire and rubber was found to be uh, not technically compliant with the specifications and therefore ineligible for award. So our recommendation that we award to Michelin North America estimated amount $6,668,228 over the three year period. This represents a 37% increase over the previous bid price for this item three years ago. The, uh, the lowest bidder was not in compliant. Their tires that were uh, bid were not uh, uh, with the same roll resistant, which creates wear and tear on other parts of the bus, uh, which is a major uh, functioning spec in our tire spec so that bid could not be accepted. Being that they bid different tires of a different quality, the price difference from the low bid to the one that we're going to accept was $741,000. That concludes my report. Are there any questions? Anyone have any questions for Mr. Trona from our committee? Any questions from other board members for Mr. Trona? 
Hearing none, uh, Lori, could I have a resolution or I'm sorry, could you make a motion to move this forward to our full board meeting next Friday? Yes, so moved. I'm gonna second that motion. And so this is approved to go forward to our board meeting. I believe that this concludes our business this morning and this is probably the shortest agenda I've had ever. And so if there are any other questions from anyone else, um, otherwise we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna conclude our meeting. So uh, I'm gonna make a motion that the performance oversight meeting is concluded. And so if anyone has any other comments before we're off the air, I think you should probably speak now because there is no technology meeting following us today. Hearing that, all right, everyone, we will see you uh, on Friday for our regular board meeting. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.